Okay. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for bearing with us as we get things set up. Um, yeah, so this is uh, the polynomial functors course. Uh, we are here at day one. Um, we're here at the Tobos Institute um, on the Berkeley campus. That's where we're filming this. We have a couple of people here in the audience here as well. Um, I don't know if you can see them. Um, but I think, I think there's also some people watching there. And I am off the edge. So there, now you can actually see me. Hi, uh, my name is Nelson. I am an incoming grad student at the University of Washington. Um, and I've been working, I guess, on and off uh, with like polynomial functors for like the past year or so. And um, yeah, and it's, it's nice to be here. Um, David, I don't know if you want to, <laughs> I guess David is messing okay. with the setup. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, so what is it going to be? I'm going to be doing every other day or so? Yeah, like, Hi everyone. Hi everyone. that um, was David. <laughs> yeah, yeah uh, he's the other instructor. Cool. Um, so I guess just a brief overview. We're setting up tech things here just to make sure the stream is working. Um, are we good? Okay, cool. Uh, let's see. So, yeah, so the purpose of this course um, is mostly because uh, David and I really like polynomial functors and we're really excited about them uh, because both because they have a lot of cool math associated with them, uh, but also because they have uh, lots of cool potential for like applications and interpretations. And we'll, we're going to preview uh, quite a few of these interpretations today. And Mostly we want to sort of spread the word about this so that if we kind of cover the preliminaries and tell you what we know, um, other people can come in and build up on our work, whether you're um, another like mathematician who is trying to like develop more of the math behind this, or if you are a scientist or a programmer who wants to like actually like apply, uh, apply these concepts, to your work and see how they could be applied. Um, we're excited about kind of all of those things. Um, and pro uh, there's probably also other connections that we don't even know about. And so uh, we'd love to like hear from you about anything uh, related to this course. Um, and yeah, that's kind, of, that's kind of why we're doing this. Um, so the way this is gonna work is we're gonna have 13 lectures um, we're going to go every Thursday and Monday at uh, 4 p.m. Pacific time, except as you saw today, um, if you're watching this live, we actually started at 4.05 Pacific time uh, because David and I are, I guess, recently, both recently from MIT where things run five minutes after the hour like that. Um, sorry, David. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Someone asked me to write a little bigger. Yeah. That's a good tip. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a little because we want to like be able to fit both of these boards in here. It might be a little, uh, but yeah, I'll try. I'll try my best to write bigger. We'll see. Um, let's see. So yeah, so every Thursday and Monday, except we're also going to have two uh, bonus lectures by uh, David Jazz Myers, who is sitting in the front row here, um, and he's going to come in on uh, I think Wednesday, July twenty eighth, and Wednesday, August fourth. Uh, for some just bonus talks, also related to the material, but like on a slight tangent. Um, they're gonna both be here at the uh, Berkeley office um, uh, for the Topos Institute, but also stream live on YouTube. And uh, we're gonna also have half hour long discussion times afterwards, kind of like, I guess, office hours or something um, for in-person attendees. Um, so. That's, uh, but we'll also try to like incorporate, well, obviously um, you're welcome to ask questions uh, on the chat, in the comment section, what have you, if you're uh, remote. Um, we have a course website. It is, uh, let's see, I should write this down. It is topos.site slash poly, uh, I believe it's a dash course. Um, and you can go here. Um, for links to our book, which we're working on. Uh, the book is very much a work in progress. Um, while you're reading it, we will probably change it. Um, but roughly, it roughly sort of follows the, or 
our course will roughly follow uh, how the book goes. Um, today's, course, uh, today's class is mostly going to cover chapter one-ish. Um, and yeah, other things on the website include a Google Doc where you can put suggestions for the book, right? If you, if you read the book and you realize uh, you have any questions or comments or suggestions, uh, please make use of that Google Doc. We'd love to hear your feedback. Um, although, of course, keep in mind, in mind, yes, it is still a work in progress. We're probably gonna like go back and change things like literally this weekend. Um, yeah. Again, feel free to ask questions. Um, you can use the chat. You can use the comments. Uh, you can go to the website. Um, or you can use the suggestions doc. There is also a form, a Google form that we set up where you can ask a, a question if you want to ask it privately for whatever reason. And of course, if you have any, uh, any remarks, any suggestions, any connections that pop into your head, uh, any corrections, if you want to like recommend us something to read, uh, feel free to leave a comment. We love to hear it. Um, yeah, that's the logistics out of the way. Um, hopefully there's no other questions there, but again, feel free to ask. And David's gonna interrupt me if there's any questions in the chat. Uh, yeah, so let's just start off um, with uh, our stuff. So uh, let's take a polynomial. What do we mean by a polynomial? Well, we can just think about a polynomial uh, from sort of classic high school algebra, right? And here's an example, y squared plus 2y plus 1. Um, except usually when we sort of talk about polynomials in like uh, high school or where you've seen them before probably, um, you plug in numbers and then you get numbers back. Um, except the polynomials we're going to be looking at in this class, uh, you plug in sets and you get sets back. And so um, let's see. So for example, if you plug in a set S, uh, you would get back a set S squared uh, plus 2S plus 1. And what do we mean by the set S squared plus 2S plus 1? Well, uh, these plus signs, you might be, you may be more familiar with these plus signs as uh, disjoint union signs like this, uh, but we're just going to use plus signs because uh, pluses are co-products in the category of sets. Um, and we're just adding these sets together. And here, a one is just the set containing one element. Uh, two uh, is just the set containing two elements. And so two, uh, two, when we write two s, it's just two times s. It's just two copies of s, um, take, uh, whose disjoint union is taken here. And when we write s squared or s to the power of some set up here, this is really uh, we want to think about this as the set of functions from 2 to s, which we will write uh, just for now in Homset notation like this. So the set of functions uh, from 2 to s, that's what we mean by s squared. And hopefully we already have the link to the website, so I'm going to erase this because it's in my way. Um, and yeah, so this as you've probably guessed, is a functor, right? Um, this is a functor from uh, the category of sets to the category of sets. And when we talk about polynomial functors, we're talking about specific functors that are uh, these uh, sums of functors that look like this. And if uh, you probably, or I guess you may know that, um, a functor of this form, so that sends a set S to a to the home set of some uh, constant set A uh, to the set S. This is a representable functor. Um, so it's a functor that takes um, some object in your category and sends it to the home set from uh, some constant. Uh, uh, from uh, some constant object in your category to this object. And when we, t and so when we write something, but we're not going to write it out like this, uh, we're just going to write this as S to the A. 
And so when we take the sum of a bunch of uh, functors like this, we're just going to get a sum of a bunch of powers. And that's going to look kind of like a polynomial, because here we just, we're really just adding um, s to the power of 2, and then two copies of s, and then one copy of 1, which you can think of as s to the power of 0. Um, and these, uh, even though we're talking about, uh, even though we call these polynomials, uh, these sets can be infinite. Um, so, for example, we could have actually written uh, maybe like n here. Um, we could have written uh, a set of real numbers here. Um, the right, the uh, the exponents can be infinite. So the things we're adding can be infinite, and in fact, we can uh, we can add up we can add up an infinite number of things as well. So uh, these can be arbitrary sums. For example, uh, this would be a polynomial. So the sum over the natural numbers of y to some natural number. Where again, even though we're writing this as a natural number, it's the set n. Um, and so this is another polynomial. Um, and so as you can see, uh, we're defining, uh, right, so I think this sets this up. And so our definition of a polynomial, I'm going to write it over here. So a polynomial figure. Oh, yes, I can write it a little bigger, hopefully. A polynomial functor is a functor set to set that uh, is an arbitrary co-product of representables. Cool. Any questions about that? I think we can. OK. Um, so given that this is the definition, we can write an arbitrary polynomial like so. And so this is going to be. Uh, our first way of thinking about polynomials. Um, this is kind of, I'm just going to call this math notation here. Um, so we can write an arbitrary polynomial P as a uh, coproduct over some uh, indexing set I of a representable functor represented by some set. Um, and we're going to denote this set as P bracket I. So um, um, I, I should clarify my notation here. When I write, um, the, uh, let's see, when I, this marker is now uncooperative. Uh, let me switch this out. <laughs> OK. Uh, when. I write something like y to the a. Um, I am talking about the uh, functor from set to set that sends um, f, uh, a set s to s to the power of a. And this is supposed to be evocative of plugging s into where y is. And the reason we use a y here is that this should remind you, uh, if you know what that is, of the Yoneda embedding, because that's really what this is doing. Um, and so up here, we have a generic polynomial. Um, it's a sum indexed over i of y to the p bracket i for some sets p bracket i. Um, now, in fact, it turns out we don't actually need to use this sort of like generic uh, capital I here to denote this set, um, because there's a very natural way to figure out what I is just from P, and the trick is is uh, the trick is to plug one in, right? Because if we do, um, let's see, if we plug in one for Y up here, we end up getting uh, just one to the power of P bracket I, which is just one, 
And so we're really just adding up i copies of 1, and so that gives us i. So instead of writing i here, we're actually going to write uh, p of 1. And that's going to be our notation for uh, whatever this set is down here. Um, and notice that sort of the, the two key components of these that we can uh, kind of adjust and play with are these, let me draw some lines down here to separate this out. Oh. Okay. Okay. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Um, so the two key parts of this are the sort of the elements of this set P of one, and then for each of these little eyes here, the elements of this. Uh, P bracket I. And uh, the reason why I write these out here is because it's going to turn out that these have uh, kind of special roles to play in our different ways of looking at the polynomial. Are they getting sound through this? No, they're getting sound through my mic. Can they hear me? Is that a problem? Can you hear me? Hello? There's feedback, that's all. Is everything plugged in? Okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah. Where was I? Okay, so that's sort of our first uh, way of thinking about these as functors. But it turns out we don't really need to think about them as functors so much as uh, we don't need to think about them as like actually taking a set in and spitting a set out. Um, as you can see, the really only they're part- getting, you, They're getting through this thing, not through hmm? you. That's what people say. Okay. okay. I can talk louder if that helps. Okay, keep going. Yeah, okay. Um, You're probably fine. Okay. Um, so the, let's see. Oh, I think I- <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Um, yeah. So instead, if we focus on just these sets, we can think of this, uh, these p bracket i's, as a collection of sets, um, or a uh, family of sets, p bracket i, indexed by some set p of one. Are we good? Okay. Um, and you might, uh, and this is just an index family of sets, um, and we're going to call this, uh, or you might hear this called a dependent set, um, because it sort of is like a, a type is to a set as like a dependent type is to one of these dependent sets. Um, but we're actually going to, we have a special name for these um, based on how uh, the perspective we're going to look them as, um, and we're going to call this an arena. Now, I'm going to probably throw a bunch of words at you, and you don't necessarily need to sort of remember all of these, but all of these terms are supposed to be like evocative of like the perspective that we're looking at these polynomials at. Um, so uh, we're going to call this, yeah, we're going to call this family of sets an arena, and then each element of this index set here of p of 1 we call a position, and then each element of P bracket I for a position I, we are going to call a direction, or specifically, a direction at the position I. Um, 
And so you can sort of think of this as like you're standing in an arena, you're standing in some position of the arena and you have a bunch of directions you can go in. And so at each position, you have some directions. Um, here, for example, we could be at this position uh, in our sample polynomial y squared plus 2y plus 1. We could be at this first position and we would have two possible directions to go in. Or we could be at this last position and have no directions to go in because this is just y to the 0. OK. And this, uh, let's see, what did I, yeah, so this is the dependent set perspective. Now, uh, before we, let's see, before we get into another way of looking at this, I want to acknowledge uh, this, a third perspective, which is not one we'll visit very often, but I just want to mention it. Um, you can also think of any dependent set, any family of sets like this, as a function, right? It's just a function from uh, this coproduct of sets, p bracket i, to uh, this index set p of 1 that sends every, uh, that tells you where each uh, element of p bracket i comes from. So it just sends each element of p bracket i to i in p of 1. Um, and in fact, given any function, you can get a dependent set like this, and vice versa. You can translate between these. Um, and so you can think of this, as, so you can think of any polynomial as a function like this. Um, for example, let me, let me just call this q for now. Um, for this polynomial q, we can think of it as a function from, uh, let's see, from q uh, uh, or into q of 1 with, let's see, so since it has four positions, there are four elements of q of 1, and the first position has uh, two elements above it going to it. The second and third positions have one element being sent to it, and the, third, uh, the fourth position here has no elements being sent to it. And so that's just another perspective. So this is sort of the function perspective, or perhaps um, you might uh, think of these as uh, sort of, uh, right, so yeah, so you have a function, and we're going to call this uh, function pi sub p whenever we need it. Um, and it's a function into p of 1 of the set of uh, sort of the union of the set of all of the possible direction sets. Um, there is, OK, so just like how there's a trick to get the um, set of positions of a polynomial, you just plug in 1. This is kind of like um, in, I guess, in high school algebra, if you write, like, how do you find the sum of the coefficients of a polynomial? You plug in one, and then that spits it out. Um, there is also kind of not quite as natural a way, but still kind of inherent way to get this set of um, this set here. Uh, that's the disjoint union of all of the direction sets. Um, if you take the uh, derivative of p, right? If you take the derivative of a polynomial, uh, really what you're doing is you're kind of pulling this uh, p bracket i down here. Um, and then you ignore the exponents, so you plug in 1 again. Um, and then you add all of those up. Then you're going to get uh, the sum of all of these p bracket i's. So um, we're just going to use, uh, we're not going to use the derivative very much, but it's just I wanted to like mention it. Um, and we're going to use this to denote the derivative, so p dot. Um, and then the positions of the derivative of p are just the, uh, all of the directions of p. So you're saying that q dot yeah. 1 is 4. Hmm? You're saying q yes. dot 1 is 4. Uh, yes. So right, because if you think about it, if you take the 2 down here, and then this goes away, it's just 2 plus 2, and that's 4. right? And so that's this set. Yeah. Um, cool. Yeah, so this is this pi sub q here, and then this is q dot 1. Okay, um, but again, we won't spend too much time on 
this. So I'm just going to fill these in real quick. Um, and then this is uh, sort of the, f uh, the uh, direction, the set of directions here are just the, uh, it's just the fiber over I. OK. Now, I drew one picture here, but this is um, kind of the function picture. Uh, there's another picture we can draw, which is kind of nice, um, which I draw all the time, is uh, we can draw these polynomials as collections of trees, um, specifically collections of, they're not very tall trees. These are just like level one trees where everything is either a root or a leaf. Um, and what, we're do, what we do is we just take each position, and that gives us a uh, corolla up here. And each direction at that position forms a leaf of the tree. So we take this. Um, this becomes a corolla with two leaves. Um, when I say, sorry, I'm saying the word uh, corolla, which is just a, uh, you can think of it as like a tree where every vertex is a root or leaf. Um, so here we have a root with two leaves. This gives us a root with one leaf. This gives us another root with one leaf. And then this gives us a root with no leaves. And that's just another way of representing y squared plus 2y uh, plus 1. And yeah, and so that's our fourth way of looking at these. Uh, we can draw these pictures of trees. And specifically, uh, each polynomial corresponds to a corolla forest. Um, and a forest is just a union of trees, so a union of these corollas. And where each position corresponds to a root that we're going to draw like that, and where each direction corresponds to a leaf, which we'll draw with an arrow there. OK, any questions so far about these? I don't know if there's anything in the chat. Let me get some water while David checks the chat. Mm -hmm. OK. Moving on. Um, yeah, so now let's make this a little more concrete, because this all, yeah, so why do we say that polynomials have um, applications, uh, cool interpretations? Um, well, we're going to st start hinting at that more and more. Um, one other way you can think of a polynomial like this is in the context of making a decision. Um, so if we, we'll just use this uh, Corolla picture here. Um, at, we can think of our positions. We can think of uh, the positions of any polynomial as a decision that we have to make. And we can think of the directions at that position as the different options uh, or the different choices for that decision. So for example, if, our, if we're at a position here, if we're at this position, uh, we can think of this as saying, OK, um, someone's asking me to make uh, this decision. And I say, OK, I have to make this decision. Well, let's check how many options are at this decision. There are two. I can go this way or that way. So this is kind of like a binary decision, like a yes or a no, or a true or a false. Um, of course, we could also, you could also ask me to make this decision. Now here I really only have one option, so it's not really making a decision at all. It's just, well, there's only one way to do it. Um, or you can ask me to make this decision, uh, which is impossible to make because there are no options here. Um, and so that's thinking of a polynomial in terms of decisions. And I like to call this, uh, or I guess I just came up with this, but uh, you can think of this almost as like a menu of decisions. You have, yeah, you're like looking at a menu and you're being asked to make a decision and then you can pick one of the options at that decision. And so that is the decision-making perspective. And why is this at all interesting? Well, um, let's say that, um, 
I'm gonna right. So we're gonna talk about why this is interesting on Monday. Uh, but to sort of give a quick preview of that, um, the idea is that uh, we're not just looking at these polynomials like on their own. The polynomials are gonna form a category, and but to form a category, we're gonna need uh, morphisms between these polynomials. Now, as functors, the morphisms are gonna turn out to be natural transformations between the functors. Um, but under this perspective, if we just focus on the decisions and options, what's actually happening to these decisions and options uh, are, is it, it's a sort of a delegation of a decision. So for example, let's say I, uh, let's say we're looking, uh, so for me to give you a morphism from uh, a polynomial P to a polynomial Q, you can think of this morphism as a delegation of a decision. And let's say I need to make a decision. Oh, I just tapped my mic. But I need to make a decision. Um, and well, let's just, so I'm just going to pick one of the decisions in my menu given by P. And let's say it's a decision where I have three different options. OK. Uh, but I'm not going to make the decision, because I don't know what to do. And so I'm going to turn to David. And I'm going to ask David, OK, um, I'm making this decision right now. Um, what, should you, uh, what should I do? And so I'm going to pass this decision on to David. And so this decision is going to uh, be set to one of David's decisions in David's menu, which is Q. And David's decisions might have uh, the same number of options, or it could have more options, or it could have fewer options. In this case, David has uh, four options in his decision. Let's see, this is me, this is David. Um, and he's going to pick, uh, he's going to make the choice there. So he's going to pick one of his options. Let's say he picks this one. And then that's going to correspond to an option, uh, to one of my options of my decision. And so by picking this option, David's really telling me that I'm going to, uh, that I should make this option. And so a morphism from P to Q is the sort of like uh, forward and backward relationship between um, I want to make a decision, I'm going to ask David to make it for me, to pick one of the options, and that's going to tell me which option I should pick. Um, and we'll formalize this next week. Um, but you can already see how these can be composed, right? Because maybe David, actually David doesn't make the decision either. David asks another person, maybe David asks you, and you have a polynomial R that's your menu. And David sends uh, his decision to one of your decisions. Maybe you have two options. And then you're going to pick one of those options. And then that's going to tell David which option he should pick, and then that's going to tell me which option I should pick. But of course, um, really, at this point, you can just kind of cut out the middleman. Sorry, David. Um, and I could just pass my decision to you directly, and you pick an option that passes back to me directly. And that's how these morphisms compose. And so you can already see uh, what that category is going to look like. OK. Um, Cool. And yeah, so another perspective that's kind of making this a little even more concrete. Um, we can think of this, I think this is our last one actually. So we can think in terms of dynamics. Uh, now what do we mean by this? Um, we're going to cover this more in day three and day four. Uh, but yeah, when we talk about a dynamical system, we are thinking of a system, let me erase this, we're thinking of a system that has um, s internal states that you can give input to and receive output from. And so it's gonna look, uh, so we have some system, it has some sort of like brain that can store like an internal state and then it takes inputs, and it gives out outputs. Um, and every time, uh, depending on what its internal state is, it's going to give out a certain output just based on that state. 
Um, and it's going to receive input uh, that along with that it's going to use along with its current state to determine what states to go to next. Um, so it's this uh, machine that uh, can like update itself like that. Um, let's see. I, I should mention it is, uh, so it's 5 p.m., but we're going to keep going because of all of the technical issues. Thanks for bearing with us. Uh, yeah, I'm just going to sort of push forward. Um, but yeah. So, yeah. And so, in fact, we can model something like this using our polynomials. And it's going to turn out that this kind of system uh, will correspond or uh, it, it is going to correspond to a specific morphism of our polynomials. And in fact, uh, if we have a certain set of outputs, um, let me just call it B, um, and a certain set of possible inputs that we call A, um, this is in fact going to correspond to a polynomial, or in fact a monomial, um, by to, uh, to the A. And so we can see that our positions actually in terms of dynamical systems uh, could correspond to possible outputs and our directions could co correspond to possible inputs. Um, but you can see here that this is a little odd, right? Because really what we're saying is that um, since each direction kind of like is associated with a position um, or it's, we're really saying that each output has a certain set of inputs associated with it. And so really, this is not quite this picture here. It's a picture, it's instead a picture where, depending on what output we give out, the possible inputs we can put in change. And so that might be a weird concept to wrap your head around, but you could think, for example, of your computer screen, where uh, your, whatever is being shown on your screen is the output. Uh, but that also, whatever is being shown on your screen is also going to affect what inputs uh, you can give it. So I have a Mac, so I have like a dock down here. And so if I see a dock down here, I can actually click the buttons on this dock. So this has given me an output and it's showing me this like, uh, th these things I can click here. Um, and so clicking any of these things is going to give me a certain input. Um, but maybe clicking this one is going to open up a new window with other things I can click. And so that's going to change the possible inputs I can give. I can click any of these. And then maybe clicking something else like hides the stock. And then I can't click any of these anymore. And so d what my output is on my computer screen actually affects what input I give in. Now you might argue that, OK, really, like I can still like click anywhere on my screen, it just, it, that ju it's just that something won't happen in that case, right? So the input isn't really changing. Um, but I think, I guess my question back to you then would be like whether that is sort of a, uh, a interesting model of like what's really happening. And so it's, yeah, and so there's something about this like nature of how our possible inputs change depending on our outputs that really seems to kind of capture how we perceive like this system to be working. Um, and so that's kind of uh, an interesting idea that David's going to expand on uh, next week. Um, yeah, and so we can think of the whole polynomial together as dictating the interface of the system. So what we can interact with, and it's what we call a mode-dependent interface. Uh, which captures this idea, dependent, which captures this idea that whatever output we give is going to change the possible inputs we have to give. Okay, let's see. Um, a little more, uh, I guess, a little more preview of these dynamical systems. It's going to turn out um, that if you think of these like decisions, instead of as decisions and options, as sort of possible outputs and possible inputs, you can see how um, putting this morphism here, um, what this is really doing is this, uh, my output is sending an output to you, and then your input 
is sending me an input. And so if there's some system behind my interface, and then you have another interface that's talking to my interface, you can stack your interface on top of my interface to have another interface interacting with my state system. Um, so these morphisms are actually going to give us a way to sort of wrap um, interfaces around each other. Um, there might be other things you want to do with dynamical systems. Uh, for example, you might want multiple dynamic uh, systems, multiple interfaces interacting with the same state space. Um, and that's, uh, it's going to turn out that that's going to correspond to products in our category. Um, you might want to put multiple systems like next to each other and like juxtapose them next to each other um, to build even larger systems. And that's going to correspond, uh, not too surprisingly, to a specific monoidal structure on our category of polynomials. And so we'll see all that in the next few days. Um, and I don't want to, let's see, I don't want to go too long, but I also just want to briefly preview um, some of the other things we're going to talk about. Um, let's see. Yeah, actually, I'll stop for questions for a second. And if anyone has questions right now, feel free to ask, and then I can keep going a little bit after that. My sense of time is way off because we, we had that interruption. But yeah, um, I guess, do, does anyone in the room have questions or anything on the chat? Get some more water. Nope. We good? OK. Maybe we should keep it somewhat further. Yeah, that sounds good. Yeah. Um, actually, let me see. I think, I think I can start this. Let's just wrap it up here. Yeah, yeah I think we can start this tomorrow. Yeah. Or not tomorrow, Monday. Yeah. Uh, again, thank you all for bearing with us. Um, a lot of this stuff, I think this is sort of roughly kind of the first half of chapter one in our book. Um, you can check that out. Um, there are some, I guess there's some exercises you can try if, you, if you're into that sort of thing. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. Um, I don't know if people want to stick around, if people have like comments, um, other remarks, other thoughts. I am happy to hear them. Um, yeah, okay, thanks. I'll end the thing then. Okay, sounds good. If we want to keep that up for a second, in oh, case okay. anyone okay. wants to yeah. ask okay. questions. Yeah, okay. but we're done here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks.